Fair Rosamund is held in a cell within her father's castle to keep her away from her lover Bjorn. The wall of the castle is six meters away from her cell, and the top of the wall is eight meters above the window of her cell. Rosamund writes a letter for Bjorn and ties it to a rock so that she can throw it over the wall to Bjorn. At what initial speed and angle above the horizontal must she throw the rock from the window of her cell so that it just goes over the top of the wall? Start this off with a diagram showing a couple things. Here's the cell, here's the wall. I've set some um, coordinates. Plus y is in the vertical up direction, plus x is in the horizontal to the right direction. Distance h from the window of the cell to the top of the wall, that's the height, and so that's 8 meters here. Distance l from horizontally from the cell to the wall is 6 meters. We don't know the initial angle of the launch of the rock. We're trying to find that out. We also don't know the initial speed of the rock. What we do know is where it has to clear. And since it's just going over the top of the wall, that would be the highest point in the rock's trajectory. So what we're going to need to do is find the kinematic equations using V0 and theta and then somehow back out from that what V0 and theta are given the other constraints of the situation, the maximum height obtained at what distance. So here's some equations that we have to work with. The initial component of velocity in the x direction is v0 cosine theta, as defined theta was there. Initial component of velocity in the y direction is v0 sine theta. So at any time, the x coordinate of position is just velocity times time, and the x velocity is the same as the initial x velocity, because that doesn't change. There is no acceleration in the x direction here. The acceleration is all in the y direction. It's minus g in the y direction. And that's what we show here. So the kinematic equation for y, um, starting at point at height 0, I specified on the diagram um, that there was an origin where we're starting just to make things easier. So that makes these kinematic equations fairly simple in form to start with. Here we have y equals v0 times time minus 1 half a t squared, which in this case is a is minus g. The velocity in the y direction, or the component of velocity in the y direction, is the initial velocity in the y direction minus the acceleration times time. And the acceleration again is minus g. So at the window, when it's starting out, the velo y velocity is the initial y velocity, the x velocity is the initial x velocity, and x and y are both zero. At the top of the trajectory, the velocity in the x direction is still just the velocity in the x direction. The velocity in the y direction, since it's the top of the trajectory, has to be zero. The height y is just h now. The x distance from the origin is now distance l. So we can combine these. Since we know the velocity y is zero, and we know that that is the initial velocity minus gt, we can solve that for time to find the time that it took the rock to get to the top of its trajectory, and that time is v naught y divided by g. Next we plug this into the y equation, so y equals v naught t minus 1 half gt squared. y at this point is h, so we can plug in all the numbers. We can plug in our new value for t that we just got, which was up here, v naught y over g, and we'll plug that in uh, where it shows up in this equation. So v naught y times t, which is v naught y over g, minus g times t squared, that's v naught y over g, whole quantity squared, divided by 2. That simplifies out. Here we've got two factors of v naught y, so v naught y squared over g, minus, well, essentially we've got 1 half v naught y squared over g, and that whole thing together just becomes 1 half v naught y squared over g. This is a good time to stop and check that the units work. This expression should give us a height that will be in units of distance or meters. What we have here are units of velocity squared, that's, so that's going to be meters squared per second squared, divided by units of acceleration. So velocity squared over acceleration. Acceleration is meters per second squared. So we have meters, per, meters squared per second squared divided by meters per second squared. All that's left are the meters, so the units work out just fine. 
this expression, h equals v naught y, v naught y squared over 2g. You can multiply both sides by 2g, get v naught y squared equals 2gh. v naught y then is just the square root of 2gh. So that's, we just found out what the y component of velocity is. It's not exactly what we need. We want the um, total speed and the angle. If we get the x and y components, we can convert that into the speed and direction. So let's find the x component next. What this is telling us is that at time t, it has traveled the distance v sub x times t, and that distance is l. So we can plug in our expression for t, v naught y over g, into this expression to find out what v sub x has to be. So solving that, so v sub x, solve this for v sub x, basically we're multiplying both sides by g over v naught. We get lg over v naught y. Now v naught y, we already got here, is the square root of 2gh. So we have lg over the square root of 2gh. Um, the g's can combine in here, so we have l times the square root of g over 2h. We're also interested later on for finding the magnitude of the speed, so though it's useful at this point to get an expression for the square of the x component of velocity, and that's going to be just L squared g over 2h. Now to find the initial velocity, in terms of the angle and speed, we can do what we did before. Um, v naught squared, this is to find the magnitude or the speed, v naught squared equals v naught in the x direction squared plus v naught in the y direction squared, so we add together these are the squares of those, combine, plug in the actual values, so our g is 9.8 meters per second per second, our l was 6 meters, so l squared is 36 square meters, our h was 8 meters, so 2h is 16 meters, plug this all in and we get that the initial speed is 13.4 meters per second. Then to find the angle, the tangent of the angle of the velocity is going to be the y component divided by the x component. So that's what we've done here, v naught y over v naught x. Square root of 2gh over l times the square root of g over 2h. This simplifies into 2h over l. As an aside right now, I'll mention something interesting about this. The necessary launch angle does not have any dependence on gravity. So gravity is weak or strong, it's the same launch angle. Another interesting thing I'll point out about this launch angle is that, what is this factor h over l? If we go back to our diagram, h is the height of the wall and l is the distance of the wall from the launch. So h over l is essentially the slope of the straight line going from the origin to that highest point in the trajectory. So 2h over l is twice the slope. Why is that? Is that some sort of coincidence? Of course it's not a coincidence. Of course it's not a coincidence. There's a good reason why the slope of the initial velocity is twice the slope of the straight line between those two points. And here's what it is. This starts out in the y direction with some component of velocity v sub y. Going from here to the apex, it slows down to a zero component in the y direction. So in between, its average velocity in that interval is half the initial, because it goes from initial to zero with constant acceleration, the average is, is half. So to travel this height, it has to be going fast enough so that in that time it would travel twice as far if there were no acceleration. That's where that factor of 2h over l comes from. Kind of cool. I mean, we wouldn't have seen that if we just plugged the numbers in first. So there's a lot to be gained by doing these analytically. Okay, so back here we have 2h over l. So then the theta itself is the arctangent of 2h over l. In this case, h was 8 meters, so 2h is 16 meters. L was 6 meters, so 16 over 6, arctangent 8 thirds, so that angle is 69.4 degrees. 
Now we're done. That's all the question actually asked us. But I'd like to point out um, some more interesting things about this system. I've already given you a hint to this when I pointed out that the correct launch angle at the beginning had nothing to do with gravity, that it was independent of gravity. As it turns out, the entire path of the trajectory is independent of gravity. How fast the projectile goes through that path depends on gravity. The higher the gravity, the faster it goes through. But the actual form and the actual path of the trajectory itself has nothing to do with how strong gravity is. I'll do that by showing a little transformation. Right now what we have is the x position and the y position both as functions of time. What I'm going to do is take the time out and make y as a function of x and show that the angle has no dependence in there when you do that. So here's how we're going to do that. Here's our expression for y. y equals v naught in the y direction times t minus gt squared over 2. Now I've plugged in our v naught y um, into this, which is the square root of 2gh, and so we get this expression for y. Our x was v in the x direction times time. Uh, plugging in what v in x direction is, l times the square root of g over 2h, we get this expression. Solving that for time, so we're getting time in terms of x now, gives us this expression. Plug that back into the y expression for time. So we have our 2gh. Now in place of time, we've got this expression, so I've put it in here. Now minus gt squared over 2. Plug that in here, so t squared is going to be x squared over l squared times 2h over g. x squared over l squared 2h over g. And here's the 2 for the factor of um, 1 half. Simplify this whole thing, 2gh, 2h, so the 2h can come out, and then we have g over g, and that completely disappears, so we have 2hx over l on this side, and over here we have the g's cancel out, the 2's cancel out, and we have hx squared over l squared. We could, in principle, factor this some more if we wanted to, but the important thing to notice is that when we've got y as a function of x, it doesn't say anything about the force of gravity, what g is. So no matter what the force of g is, it follows the same trajectory, y as a function of x.